Swagger. and I'd like to welcome you to the 1990s Getting Ready. The central purpose of our program is to focus on our rate of personal growth in a rapidly changing world. For example, how updated are you? How on track are you? Massive changes are occurring globally, and some of us will make a smooth transition into the coming decades, and other, others of us may lag behind. The idea is to be progressive in all major areas of our lives in our values and lifestyles, in our politics and ideologies, as well as in our loyalties and levels of humanity. I'd like to introduce our guest, FM 2030, who is a noted philosopher, futurist, and author of the book, Are You a Transhuman? Hello, FM. Delighted to be here sharing the future with you, Nancy. Thank you. FM, how did, on earth did you get the name 2030? Is that your mother's name or your father's <laughs> name? Did I, do I come from a family of 2030s? Not really, no. This is a name I picked uh, a few years ago. The idea is that you know, conventional names, as a rule, define a person's past, you know, one's nationality, ideology, uh, not ideology, but ethnicity, uh, religion, ancestral profession, and so on. Uh, I really long ago outgrew these old world affiliations or territorialities. I wanted a name that defines my future, my hopes and dreams. That's where I go, that's where I spend a lot of my time. So I picked a name that uh, reflects and evokes the future. 2030 meaning the year 2030 because the years leading up to the year 2030, meaning the next 20, 30, 40 years, in my view, using my scanners and remote, remotes as well as I can, tell me that there'll be a very exciting time. I hope so. You're a philosopher as well as a futurist. What special emphasis do you have in your philosophy that makes it unique? Well, uh, I don't know that it's unique, but uh, I focus on the future and have for the last at least 30, 35 years when there was no such thing as a future, uh, futurism or future studies. Uh, there were a handful of us who wrote about the future or talked about the future or held seminars on the future, but there was really no such discipline. Mm. In fact, a long, long time ago, way back in the early 60s when I began teaching in this field uh, in New York City, I remember my course became quickly dubbed as a course <laughs> for kooks and weirdos uh, because we were going to talk about things like computers, for example, or uh, uh, ultra-intelligent systems or solar energy or space colonization, etc., etc. Speaking of that, you have made a lot of forecasts for professional groups, for mm -hmm. business groups. What, in what area are these forecasts and have they proven to be correct? Well, it all depends on who I make the forecast for. I do consulting, for example, for engineers or uh, uh, corporations, government agencies psychologists, psychiatrists, writers, film, film, film people, television writers, etc., etc. Architects, by the way, planners, and so on. So it all depends. I target my projections or predictions to suit the specific needs of the group I'm addressing. Specifically, for an architectural organization, if, if they asked you to, to come in and tell them about the future of architecture for a specific design or, or a shopping center or a town or community or even a space habitat, what would your facility be as a futurist to guide and assist them? Well, for example, with architects, and I do give a lot of talks and hold seminars for architects and developers and so on, my focus there would be to alert them to the fact that a lot of things are changing, not only the technologies and the material that is used, um, but also the fact that our demographics change, the fact that our values change, the fact that, for example, our family compositions change. A lot of architects and developers go on creating habitations or even communities that are uh, geared to the needs of the 1950s and 60s and they're totally oblivious to the mm -hmm. fact that we are living in the 1990s where the rhythm of life, the pace mm, of life, yes. the composition of our uh, social uh, interactions, everything is changing. Uh, so that's really my emphasis with them. You asked me earlier uh, how accurate I've been. I think the best thing is uh, to go back to things I've written, and I won't mention names, but uh, 
25 years ago, 30 years ago, when I made a lot of projections in my writings, people scoffed and dismissed them as, you know, too Give far out. Give me an example of this. What would someone say um, 20 years ago scoff at that is actually occurring right now? Well, for example, events in Eastern Europe. Uh, I forecast these way back in the 60s. I suggested that we were moving toward massive, irreversible decentralization of power uh, everywhere on the planet, uh, that the, 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 uh, the forces of change were pervading all areas of life, that it was becoming increasingly difficult, for example, for governments even, to monopolize power, not mm. only governments, by the way, family systems, school systems, corporations, etc., etc., religious institutions, and so on. Yes. And I was very specific, by the way, with my forecast. Uh, at the time, they didn't sound very plausible. Or, for example, that we would move toward globalization. Now, in the 1960s, when we were still in the throes of nationalism and ethnocentricity, mm. to talk about globalization was something very inaccessible and far out and far fetched. Well, the fact is that we are now in, the, in a globalized environment. We have global economy, global electronic uh, funds transfer, global uh, agencies, global institutions, global uh, job mobility, global tourism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What do you think is the main idea or concept that has aided in globalization of our planet? Telecommunications, for example? A lot of things, Nancy. I'd say global telecommunication is only one. Global transportation is yet another. Mm -hmm. the, the convergence of nations, the fact that, for example, the EC, meaning European Community, which again in the 1950s and 60s was not considered something that had a future. People dismissed it as something, you know, an ideal or I idealistic. Today has become a powerful, powerful entity. And by the same token, there are similar movements in Africa and Asia and South America and so on. And I see that as an irreversible trend toward globalization. But you know, I hasten to add, Nancy, globalization is not our ultimate destiny. It's not our ultimate destination. What is our ultimate destination? Well, I'm not sure that there are any ultimate destinations, mm -hmm. but uh, globalization is merely a stepping stone towards something even more advanced, and that is spreading out across the solar system. Now, do you believe that we will spread across the solar system within the next 20 years, or is it something that we're looking at 100 years from now? Oh, no. We already are. Listen, the Soviet Union has the Mir space station. There have been people who have stayed there for as long as a whole year connect, disconnect. The Americans will uh, orbit a space station sometime in the mid-1990s. The Europeans have plans for uh, the Japanese are on their way to the moon this very minute. We are on our way to the moon and to Mars. I mean, there are all kinds of plans. You this know, is so exciting. It's it so exciting. exciting. Let's stay on this topic just for a moment before we get on to our RPG rate of personal growth, which is our topic for this session. Will people be able to have families out in space, develop communities where children are born. I mean, zero G is a very difficult environment to habitat. It's um, difficult for our bone systems, our whole digestive tracts. There's been a lot written about astronauts coming back with some problems, physical problems. How will we deal with this? Well, first we can approximate and gravity, Earth gravity out in space in the early stages, in the coming, let's say, decade or two or three. But somewhere later on, when we really move toward extensive colonization, where we begin colonizing, for example, Mars, and when we have a lunar base, and when we have you know, habitats elsewhere on the planet and go out into what is called deep space, we obviously will have to make significant changes, in my view, in the human physiology, because these bodies are Earth-specific. They, they, they crystallized or coalesced out of specific conditions on this planet. But as we move out, where conditions are entirely different, mm -hmm. obviously we will need more sophisticated bodies. I mean, we're not going to, for example, be eating when we're out there in, let's say, uh, in the orbit of Neptune or in interstellar space. So, so you're saying we will become, we'll move beyond transhuman, which is the movement occurring right now, into posthuman, right. where we're partially human and partially a mechanical operative, like partly computer, well, partly animated to function. <laughs> Well, listen, when you talk of mechanical, there's nothing more mechanical than humans. There's a in lot fact, of truth to that. In fact, the more primitive uh, the, the life form, let's say an ant or uh, a uh, rodent of some kind, mice, rats, and we humans, the more primitive we are, the more mechanical we are. I mean, we breathe in, we breathe out, we have to eat at certain hours, we have to sleep every few hours every night. If we don't, our whole system breaks down. 
we, we, uh, we malfunction, we break down, etc. So I would be very careful about the word mechanical. We started out as highly mechanical, automated beings. We are moving toward entities or organisms that will uh, be much more difficult to predict and much more sophisticated where in fact we will have extraordinary uh, viability out in space, as I say, even in interstellar space. It's an exciting topic, very exciting. Getting on to our rate of personal growth, could you please explain to me how you came up with the RPG concept? Well, RPG, rate of personal growth, you know, it's become axiomatic now that there, is a lot of, there are a lot of changes, rampaging changes in the world, right? Events in Eastern Europe, events in Western Europe, South Africa, for example, the phase out of apartheid. In South America, there are massive, you know, movements of all kinds. Right here in North America, we have had extraordinary changes and upheavals, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the youth movement, the um, youth, uh, workers' participation movement. Now we have the vegetarian movement, which is extraordinary. And the animal view, movement. The Pet animal movement, yes. the animal liberation yes. movement. Um, movement. I mentioned workers' participation movement, uh, the ecology movement movement, the peace movement, all of these have brought about massive changes in all areas of our lives. And what I'm suggesting is that although it's axiomatic that there are all these upheavals and changes, massive transformations going on everywhere in the world, it seems to me that the individual ought to ask, what does all this mean to me? How do all these extraordinary changes Have impinge? you developed tools? Well, yes, there are tools, self-monitors, which help the individual to assess and monitor its rate of personal growth in this rapidly changing world. Now, let's take me for example. You say, I read a lot and I'm aware and abreast of a lot of the changes that are occurring globally. But I need to develop in specific areas of my life. For example, maybe I know a lot about international affairs, yet I may not know too much about my health. I may be able to make money and finance projects. However, I may continually get into the same difficult situations or torn apart relationships. I'm having blockages. Mm -hmm. How would you deal with that with your RPG? Well, that's the whole idea that uh, for an individual to grow effectively in any one area of life, we really need to grow in, in all areas. And one of the purpose of, these, of developing these self-monitors is to help, the in to help uh, individuals see the interconnection of these uh, of, of different areas of growth as you suggest for example a person may be progressive or online in one area for example as a global person mm -hmm. but fall behind in others and that is the whole idea and i have at least you know identified 25 areas but there could be more the whole thing is that you can be progressive in some areas but be lagging in others and that sort of will slow you down it's sort of like a person who's continually on a uh, on a uh, on a runway never developing enough never thrust off. to to yes. to lift off so what mm -hmm. i'm suggesting is that we really each of us needs to look very carefully at many areas of growth for example um, how effectively do we use the new high tech how post industrial are we how well do we manage our time? How updated are we? In other words, how information rich are we? How creative are we at a time when creativity is becoming more and more important? How effectively do we use our intelligence? How well do we manage our emotions? How fluid are we in a hyperfluid world? How rivalrous are we at a time when we ought to be moving toward collaborativeness? So many people dissipate a lot of time competing. Or for example, are, how familiar are we with new high high-tech reproductive techniques and new lifestyles and how global are we, how cosmic are we, how ideologically uh, tu 